you're a real man, what do you do? <laughs> the only one. You can't wait to tell your spouse. You can't wait to tell your colleague. You can't wait to go to work and tell somebody. And you're like, oh my God, I can't wait. So what happened? If you haven't seen my TV show, you should get cable. That's what we need to do. From doing a TV show to doing corporate events, I've been so lucky to connect with many passionate entrepreneurs worldwide. What I've learned from a business perspective, because this is the formula for success, no matter who you talk to, attitude will drive your behavior. Would you agree? And your behavior will drive your consequences every single time. Right, we got the concept. Okay, we got the concept. We got we got the equipment, right? We got the brand. You guys got that. And then again, we got the content that we create. That's the easy part. This is the big one, the big C, which is the commitment. What should you do? That's right. All right. 10 Xers. Do not fail me. True test. Here it comes. There's skill, and then there's will. Listen to what I'm saying. There is skill, and then there is will. And here's the interesting thing. I know a lot of people who have a lot of skill, but have no what? Will, right? You ever look at somebody who's successful, and you say, why them, why not you? Yes, okay, that's me too. You have more control, but your costs are also gonna be what? Higher. Now, here's where some of the magic is starting to kick in. You can talk to any CEO in the B2B business, any CEO. You walk into his office and they only care about three things. People too. Yeah, he with the suit, put it up. There you go. I hope you can see this. I'll try to draw big. Let's pretend for a moment that I had seven territories. You remember I wrote that out? Yes or no? Boom, territory two, territory three, all the way to territory number one, seven. So now I've segmented my market. So content is gonna start being created by machines. And I'm telling you right now that those people, you guys, the content creators that connect with people are the ones that are gonna win. Some people think, well, it won't work for my industry. Really? It'll work for any industry. Trust me. The majority of the time when we're looking to fix something, repair something, or learn something, where do we go? YouTube. We don't even want to read anymore. We go to YouTube. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. When you're doing your thing, beautiful things begin to happen. It's like the law of attraction kicks in. You know what I mean? It's almost like you're in line with the universe. Everything works. And when you do your thing, everybody gets an automatic MBA, which stands for what? Mega bank account money. Are you with me? So we don't want to do a thing. We want to do a what? Beautiful. Put it all together for Victor Antonio. Here we go. All right, there we go. I'm not here to mess around. You ready to learn? Yes or no? That's how it works in today's market. Whether it's B2B or B2C, you see the similar pattern. Matters. How do you just, you know, in other words, say you got to start doing these things, pushing them, but also encouraging them. Oh, look at this. This is where it gets, dude, this is, this is like so interactive with audience. Matt, can you imagine this with your customers? Check this out. Now, what does all this have to do with selling? It has everything to do with selling. Welcome to another episode of Sales After Dark. This is episode number 76 on the way to 100. Now, if you're watching this on a replay, do me a favor, fast forward it, because I'm going to say hi to my fans here, my folks, and then I'll get into some content. Tonight, we're going to do questions and answers. I thought, you know, it's been a while since I did a question and answer session. So tonight, we do questions and answers. But before we do that, let me see who is on the chat, who is on the line, so to speak. Missouri, check it in. Herb, what's happening? Ah, oh, here he is. West Coast, Mia Knox. Always glad to have you. Shrutesh Godambe. Hello, Victor. Hope you're doing good. Well, I have small suggestions. You can also save your courses on Udemy or Udemy, Upgrad, or other online platforms. You can also activate Join button on YouTube. Thank you, man. I do have a course on Udemy, by the way. So I do have one up there. 
uh, Ahmed Noor from Manitoba, Winnipeg, man. Sending you love right back, my friend. And there is Mr. Las Vegas himself, man. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, man. Chris, my man, Stone, the gentleman who does the intro. Uh, the cool content, the brand commitment. Let's do our what? Thank Chris, man. I'm looking forward to seeing that interview, by the way. By the way, Chris has helped me put together some uh, sales influence podcast interviews, like actually live interviews. And we just did Jeff Shore. And Chris assures me that the the video and the interview came out excellent. So, by the way, Jeff Shore wrote the book called Following Up and Closing the Sale. And so I have a one-on-one -on -one chat with him. So check out the Sales Influence Podcast. So just, again, Sales Influence Podcast, you'll find it on the different channels. Also, Inquisitor says, phenomenal intro. Give Chris Stone some credit for that. In fact, give him most of the credit, actually. Uh, TJ Salgado, Philippines. Uh, hello, Master VA. Thank God it's Friday. It is my Friday. Today is my Friday, man. So let me see. This self-promo video is a movie. Yai Vargas. It was actually part of a movie. I have a small little movie on Amazon called Beyond the Stage, and we grabbed some of that footage. So, yeah, it was good. Fabio Vargas. Now, tell me that isn't a cool name. Fabio Vargas, man. You just don't have the long Fabio hair, man. That's the only thing that's missing, man. So, hey, Fabio, thank you for joining me today, man. Ahmed Noor again. Sales after dark. Do your what? Do your thang. Never a thing. Always do a what? A thang, man. So, you got it. So, uh, you should try in Hollywood. You can be a great movie star. Dude, I like you already, man. I, you know, I knew I liked you for it. There he is, James Buckley, my man. Oh, listen carefully, people. Listen carefully. I just interviewed that guy right there, James Sigwa Sales Buckley. Uh, uh, so this interview is so good. It's, and I'm not saying that just, I mean, I've had great interviews, but this one with James Buckley, it'll probably be ready in another week. So again, sign up for the Sales Influence Podcast or just subscribe to the channel. You know the deal. The channel is uh, right here. That little subscribe thing that you hit down here somewhere. There you go. Bam, bam, bam. Hit the subscribe. So check that out, man. James, it's going to be a good one, man. So I'm glad you like the intro, man. Uh, let me see you got. Ermgard Roman. I love it, man. Thank you for being here. I think it's your first time here. Ermgard, where are you from? Let me know where you're from. Uh, hit that like button and share. Love it. Mike K says, hello, Victor. DFW, don't know what that means. I guess it's the airport. Uh, LinkedIn user, hey, right back at you, LinkedIn user. Uh, I, DFW, still don't know what that means, but I like the fact that you keep them in three letters, Inquisitor. I still don't know what you're talking about. So, uh, Pete, preview. My man Pete also has, I saw your video, man. I saw one of your videos. Uh, you did an interview on LinkedIn, man. Check out Pete. He's got some stuff going on interview. You're starting to get online, which is very cool, man. Good for you, man. But guys, Tim Alt, let's kick this guy off. I don't know. Should we keep him on? Kick him off? And yeah, we'll keep him on. Tim, thanks for joining us. Shep from Indiana, love it. Another LinkedIn user from Chicago, hometown. Thank you for being here. Sean Cherez, Singapore says hi. Bam, Singapore is a fine city. So TJ, off topic, MJ or LBJ? You're asking a guy from Chicago, MJ or LBJ? Come on, come on. 23, baby. Michael Jordan, come on. You know the deal. You know the deal. Uh, all right. So Dallas-Fort Worth is in the house. All right, man. Uh, my man, Doug Lehman. It's been a while. What's up in Lehman's term? Check out Doug Lehman. Uh, my man, Buckley again. Uh, yeah, man. There you go. All right. So today I got some stuff, but I'm opening up the chat line, so to speak. So, you know, if you guys have questions, now would be a good time to ask these questions, man. Uh, and uh, Chris Stone says I should definitely kick off the Buckeye Go Blue, man. So, and then uh, I think Pete agrees with me. It's MJ all the way, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. Mm, no, no, can't go there, man. So, uh, you guys pick a topic you want to head off tonight. Um, <laughs> TJ says, sorry for the dumb question, man. Even Tim is, says MJ. So, and again, by the way, uh, the, these interviews I'm doing, uh, I'm trying to do something differently. One of the reasons I really wanted to talk to, let's say, James, and I talked to, he knows a, a guy by the name of KD also that I interviewed, is I'm trying to find people who are doing frontline stuff. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so, you know, you can interview other sales gurus, authors, trainers, and all that. <clears throat> but what I'm trying to do is find people who are like in the front lines, right? Really selling on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, I, I wrote some notes here because I interviewed, and I'm, I'm going to just start with my stuff, and I'll put some stuff up, but I'll answer your questions. Uh, you just interrupt me anytime you want. 
And so I was talking to KD, Kevin Dorsey, uh, and then it's one of those things we're having this conversation, and it was a good conversation. And he said something really interesting. He, he said basically when we look at how we sell and how do we become great at selling, he had a very simple formula. And again, I look at this. Uh, you guys are talking sports. You guys go do that. And so he said something that's really interesting. He said basically this. He said, I said, what's the trick to becoming good at selling? What, in your opinion, I asked him, what is it about selling? And he said, Victor, it's really easy. I had to write it down. He said, it was such an easy formula. He said, first, you have to learn. Then he says, you have to practice. And this is going to be sound so obvious. And then he says, you're going to have to do. He says, that is what my successful salespeople do. And I said, well, okay. So I said, he said, learn, practice, do. The KD formula, right? And I was like, man, this, this is a simple formula. And then he went on to explain it. And again, once I published the interview, I'll let him really add some flavor to it. But, but he got me to thinking. I said, well, tell me a little bit more. When you say learn, what do you mean? And what I thought was interesting that in his learning process, what they do is they use something called chunking. And I knew what he meant as soon as I, as soon as he said it, I knew what he meant by chunking. Chunking means that instead of trying to learn a lot, you practice on just a chunk and you really focus in on learning that chunk and you rehearse that chunk. So for example, in the last Sales Tales After Dark, I talked about you know how you do the introduction, how you leave the voicemail. He literally told me that they could spend half a day just rehearsing like two, maybe three lines. Half a day just rehearsing two, maybe three lines. He says, Victor, when you leave the voicemail, when you're talking to the client, you have to have the right tone, the right inflection, the right pauses, the, the right drops in voice, the whole bit. And he said he basically chunks what he's actually doing. The second part, he says, is you practice. Now, this one was interesting because we all know that we have to practice. But he, he used a phrase that I've never heard. I mean, I knew what he meant, but I'd never heard it. He said, and you've heard this, right? He said, basically, he said, practice. He said, practice. I got to write this out. He said, practice. He says, on the process, practice on the process, not the prospect. Practice on the process. I and mean, we, we all know that. Never practice on your client, right? But I love that phrase. He says, practice on the process, not the prospect, which means is that you practice with your team people. You practice with each other. You figure out how you're going to get the process down. And we talked about the, uh, the 2 a.m. call. The 2 a.m. call is that if I call you at 2 a.m. and I wake you out of a dead sleep, can you deliver your pitch? Can you deliver your lines? Can you deliver your content without thinking about it? And, I, and we were both like in sync because we're like, that's the level you have to be at. When you're talking to a client, you're no longer thinking about what you have to say. It's already pre-programmed because you already practice the process. You don't have to practice on the prospect. And then the last part, and then I'll grab some questions, on the do piece, he says, go out and do. But what I love, he said, he, he, we talked about the 10,000 hour rule, right? The 10,000 hour rule, if you remember Malcolm Gladwell's book, by the way, have you guys ever read Malcolm Gladwell? Let me know if you read Malcolm Gladwell. I think he's a great writer, very just an intellectual writer. He wrote The uh, Tipping Point, and my favorite Malcolm Gladwell book is one called Outliers. you got to read Outliers. But in Tipping Point, he basically looked at people who became experts in their field. And, and I, oh no, maybe that was Outliers, I think. And basically what he said is that they practiced, you know, the 10,000-hour rule. But he also reminded me, KD did, that, you know, it's not practice. He said it's purposeful practice because you can practice the wrong thing for 10,000 hours. And then he said something interesting. I said, come on, if we had to practice cold calling, how long would it take us to actually build 10,000 hours worth of practice? It's too long. He says, but when you practice with purpose, with intent, that was the big word. When you practice with intent, then all of a sudden you become more of an expert quicker, faster, and you get to that 10,000 hour rule, so to speak. So I just wanted to share this with you. This is kind of something I just want to throw up here. He says, this is the ultimate process to actually learn how to be successful in selling. Learn what you have to learn, really, and then chunk the information. Because sometimes we try to learn too much and we don't get it, right? Second, practice. But don't practice on your prospect. Practice on your process so it becomes automatic, almost knee-jerk. And the last part is do. And actually take the time to practice with intent. And so when I do keynotes, if you watch my keynotes online, those keynotes are so rehearsed in my head. Every pause, every cadence, every joke, every gesture is rehearsed. 
And so it's not when I get up there and do the presentation. I tell people a lot, anybody can speak. There's a lot of people that can speak, but there's very few people that can deliver a great message. That's the difference. You know, a lot of people can do a lot of talking, a lot of speaking, but it takes a certain amount of practice to be able to deliver that with consistency and openness. So I wanted to share that with you, and then I'll grab some stuff here if you guys have some questions, but I'll push that over. And let me see what we got here. Uh, Craig Isaac, I'm on the front line from Fort Worth, Texas. It's empty all the way, by the way. When should sellers push forward in a person meet for in-person meetings versus Zoom in a COVID environment? The relationship gap is huge on Zoom. You know, Craig, this is the debate we're constantly having. And so, you know, I think what a lot of people are finding, and let me back up. If it's a B2B environment, I'm going to agree with you because it's really hard to get a lot of people actually on a call, right? And really connect with a lot of people. And so, the question really becomes, if this is if this is the new environment that we're going to be in for a while, and I really think that this is not going to go away, Craig. This is not going to go away. So we as salespeople have to get over that mindset that we have to be in the room with them. What if I just, just totally remove that option from you, Craig? Let's just do a hypothetical. If I totally remove that option, I burn the boats, basically. You know, burn the ships, you know, do a Hernan Cortez on you. Burn the boats, you can't go back. You can't go back to face-to-face, -face, hypothetically. How would you change your calls? What would you do differently? And I would argue, and the fact that you mentioned Zoom, I love it because I think too many people use Zoom, and Zoom has a lot of drawbacks when it comes to really connecting with people. There's so many other software uh, packages that you can use out there to really connect with people at a different level. And so I would challenge you, Craig, and say, you know, what different tools can you use to engage? Like, for example, I had to get this board, right? Because this board, Craig, has been like a moneymaker for me. Just being able to draw things here, you know, with the client, kind of do some collaboration, you know, go full screen, show you cool stuff like that, you know, put graphics up here, all this stuff I had to learn because in my mind, I couldn't travel for a while anymore. So that would be the first challenge I, I, I would give you. What if you had to do that without the benefit of that, right? But let me answer your question because it's only fair that I do. So when you're talking face to face, it's hard to tell because some people are very concerned, very paranoid, right? It's depending on their age. And the answer is, it's very difficult because you have to look at the person and how secure they feel. For example, here in Georgia, we're a little more open right now. You know what I mean? As far as you still have to wear masks when you go into the stores. But I can tell that, I mean, you just go to the restaurants and everything. I mean, it's just wide open, right? And so the rules here are a little different. But I'm sure if you go to the West Coast, like Los Angeles, I mean, it's a totally different story. So it's a hard question to answer because it depends on the culture and the folks. I still think that there's a lot of upsides to us doing the distance selling. Is it a little more difficult? To some extent, there's some pros and cons. We can do that Ben Franklin, pros and cons. The con is I'm not in the room. The con is I don't have that visual context, right, in the room with them. It's harder for me to establish a connection, especially if I got five people on a Zoom call. It's really hard to do that. And so maybe part of our plan should be, Craig, is, well, how do we find ways that before we get on a Zoom call with five people, maybe we can develop some type of strategy to connect with them before we get on the call. Maybe we can develop a strategy, well, maybe I'll connect with each individual before we get on the call and maybe ask them key questions so when they do get on the call, there's some type of familiarity. So I guess that would be the challenge I would give you. You know, that it is difficult to tell somebody, hey, you know, can we do the face-to-face? -face? When they're saying, no, I'm still a little paranoid. Because sometimes it's not about the individual, it's that the fact that they're worried about going home and giving it to somebody else. So you're dealing with that level of fear. But I still would challenge you, Craig. I know it's a long answer, by the way. I apologize. But I think there's ways of doing this. And, you know, last point. I, had a, I was doing a coaching session before this early on. And one of the things we talked about, this guy that I'm working with sells insurance. And it was all face-to-face, -face, Craig. It was all face-to-face, -face, right? What he's finding is that he's... He's not having to travel, for example, he's in Chicago, coincidentally. He's not having to travel to the offices, right? He's not closing as many deals, he said. He says, but here's the flip side, Victor. He says, because I'm not traveling, all that travel time in between all these meetings is allowing me to make more calls so I got more people to meet with. So even though I'm closing less, I'm actually, at the, at the end of the month, I'm basically closing more deals because I'm touching more people virtually. So... Glass half full, man, I think, Craig. Again, sorry for the long answer, man. Hopefully, 
that was close to what you were looking for, but it's a hard one to call. It really is. Uh, let me see. Craig was right there. Uh, the top three priorities, Chunk, you recommend for a newbie salesperson to learn practice do? Absolutely, man. Uh, let me see. Lianne? I don't even know how to pronounce that name. Leanne. Liana. Okay, something like that. Rivera, I got the second part. Sorry, Victor. Maybe you can see my name now. Thanks for the shout out. Love your show. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Uh, LinkedIn user, now I know who you are. Uh, Gladwell, love him, man. Uh, outlier, uh, the tipping point, and talking to strangers. I've only read the first two. I didn't read the last the last one. Uh, since the mind cannot differentiate between what is real or imagined, uh, visualization works uh, are almost as efficiently as real-world practice. I think it does, man. I think if you see it in your mind's eye. I learned that from Zig Ziglar many years ago, that he would rehearse the speech in his head, and it's part of the programming, right? Uh, what was the guy who was in prison for like many years but and wrote a book? You guys are going to tell me what it is because you guys are smarter than me. Remember, he was in prison for a long time, and he wrote a book, and he talked about going into his own head and actually writing that whole book. You guys know what I'm talking about. You'll let me know. Uh, how to design a process when you have a new business? Since when you since we plan something, things get a little bit different. Then we again we have to change the whole sales. Yeah, I think we I think the joke here is that man plans, God laughs, right? Because you can do all the planning in the world. I mean, as soon as you write a business plan, it's pretty much outdated. The question is how much flexibility is built into that business plan. I think I would begin. Uh, you know, my engineering brace, brain, Shrutesh, would say this, that if I'm trying to get, if I'm trying to b develop here, and let's say I'm trying to build a business, and I say that my revenue is, I'm just going to say it's 500K a year. That's first year. I'm just trying to do 500K, right? That's, this is how I, I would do my business plan. I know what I want to build, so I, I figure out, well, here's my product, right? I know what my costs are, so I know what my profit is, right? So now, since I know what my profit is, I now know how many units or packages I have to sell, right? Then I give myself six months to try to hit that number or one year. Now the plan becomes, who do I sell to? So then I would identify who's my target market, right? And my target market could have three tiers, right? We've talked about it. tier one, high level clients, tier two, identify those, identify those, and tier three, identify those. And if it's just you working by yourself, I would ask myself a different question. I said, if I go after tier one clients, how likely am I to close a deal? Maybe these people would buy 60% of the time. I'm making this up. But tier two seems more aligned with my market. The average sale won't be as high, but they're about 80% buy. Now tier three, they're about 90% willing to buy, but the average price is gonna be very low. So maybe you'll find that tier two, somewhere in the middle, is your mid market. So now that I know I got to go after the mid-market, who are they? Who do I contact within these mid-market companies to sell to them? And I would spend the first, I don't know, first two or three months trying to figure out how to approach the sales process and maybe find out why they don't want to buy. And that would be the beginning of my business plan because I need to know, you know, in business they have something called the minimum viable product, an MVP, right? You build the minimum, vi minimum viable product here, you take it to the market, see how the market reacts. Can you get to that number? Market says, no, you can't. Then you have to go back and reevaluate. And so you can spend a whole lot of time building a plan out. Now, what I didn't talk about is the marketing piece. So again, when you're looking at something like this is, how are you going to do the marketing? How are you going to do the outreach? That's the big part, right? If you're going to do all inbound, uh, that's going to take you a long time. If you're going to do outbound, then how are you going to do it? Again, we identify the clients, we know the product, we know the market, we know who we want to sell to, we identify the ideal client profiles, right? Who we're going to target in the company. We position it with good pricing and services. Now let's start making the calls. Let's start setting up the meetings. Let's start getting our presentation and our pitch going. That's kind of the nutshell of what a business plan should contain. But I would try to do something and just, you know, almost do like a pilot project. Just take three months. And in those three months, your goal is to figure out who you're selling to, will they buy it, will they pay for it, and then what marketing do I need to draw in the right clients, and then begin to measure there. I think when people start planning for a year or two down the road, anything can happen, like a coronavirus, right? Anything can happen. So I think by shortening the timeline and then really working hard within those three months, you'll get an idea of whether something's gonna work for you or not. That's my short, 
very short MBA answer. So uh, let me see, what do you got here? Uh, uh, the intent is what drives the results. Craig, video, uh, Cra uh, Craig, video for the win uh, in person are on the rise again, but great caution is here. Use video to work people through the communication. We've seen great success with video. So James, when James, by the way, the reason James got on my Sales Influence podcast is I interviewed his boss, if I can say his boss, uh, John Barrow, great guy, great sales trainer, uh, great conversation. Check it out on the Sales Influence podcast. It was a good interview. And James, who I'd never heard of, reaches out with a video. And it was the most, I thought, the most sincere video, very specific, what he wanted. And then I pushed back a little bit, like, why would I want to interview you? He came back with a basically six or seven bullet points of why he would be of benefit to me on my podcast, and the deal was done. And so his video outreach is what hooked me. So perfect example of video working. Am I right, James? Let him know. All right. My favorite book about learning. Oh, I don't remember the title, Juka. Uh, something about Made Impossible. You know, it was like it was like the Made to Stick, but it was like something. Oh, man, you're killing me right here, Juka. You know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to come back and put it down in the, in the notes on YouTube, okay? Uh, but there's the book I like is, I talked about it before. It talks about memory because I think how you learn things, right? How you learn them and how you retain them and then how you recall them is what really triggers, you know, that that type of brain power. So let me think about it, and I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, that was great stuff. Uh, practice till it sounds natural. Absolutely, man. Uh, Craig Isaac, yes, it's B2B. So it's a tough one, Craig, because, again, it's th these are long – I assume it's a big deal, too. It's long sales cycles. you got multiple buyers. And, I mean, the latest study I saw, Craig said, on average, in a B2B enterprise-type sale, you have almost 11 people involved in the buying process. 11 people. I mean, it's hard enough to wrangle them live uh, in person. But to try to get that many people, uh, you know, one of the things I would suggest, if you can do it, only if you can swing it, is to figure out, is there any way to chunk them, if I can use that word again? In other words, you can't meet with all the buyers, but maybe meet with two or three at one time just to figure out what their needs are and begin to kind of triangulate who you need to talk to. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what you're pitching and what you have to offer. So I think the more compelling you can make it, this you already know. And so I think people are reluctant to meet. If everybody's working from home, the upside is, Chris, that people are at home. And I found that it's easier to get a hold of people and talk to people. So, and another dynamic, by the way, one more, is that a lot of these organizations, because they're realizing you could work from home, get more done, they're actually flattening their organizations, which means less people are involved in the buying process. And I think that's a subtle upside of the pandemic in terms of getting people in the room to make a decision. So anyway, check that out. Uh, Sparrow still just got off work, man. Glad you made it, man. Uh, Brett W. said, what's your name? Uh, I don't even know where to start with that one, brother. Uh, thank you. Uh, we sell software, so the relationship angle is very challenging when there's so much software, when so much about software is trust. Yes, Chris. Uh, I, I, I like your topic tonight because it's not only is, is it trust, it's also, you know, because there's so much, there's so much that has to go with, uh, and I know what you mean by trust, though. You know, we're talking about portability, right? Moving data over. We're talking about privacy issues, right? And then they got to trust you to be able to take care of their data for them, so forth and so on. And so it's such a, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those conversations you have to have, and it's almost like you really have to kind of be there. And so I would recommend, you know, find tools, man, like this to help you kind of have those discussions for collaboration and so forth and so on. But, but I know what you mean because I used to be a product manager and I used to have a software team. And so I used to go with salespeople on sales calls and just talking software and trying to, especially trying to get them off a legacy system. So if they have a legacy system, that was already bad enough, right? Because there's a lot of work involved in, in, in moving, porting somebody over from a legacy system. If they had some internally developed system, well, then there's a lot of people who have, you know, a little stake in the software, so they don't want to give it up. So that's another set of new dynamics, right? And if they're not doing anything, they're saying, well, why should we start now? Another set of new dynamics. I feel your pain, brother. I really do. You don't know how much I feel your pain, man. So uh, I don't know if I'm helping you tonight, but at least I'm empathizing with you. How's that? Master VA, do you give your recruits, do you give your recruits your prospects? Just talked with someone I recruited to work with us, but she had she was hesitant due to no prospects. I told her it's not a problem. I can give her one. 
man, I would fire her already. <laughs> I would. I mean, if, so, if, if I hire a salesperson and they say, hey, uh, I don't know if I want to work with you because you don't give me prospects, that's an issue right there. You know, salespeople are hunters. They go get prospects. If a company gives you one, that's a bonus, right? And so that's a scary, that, that, that would scare me, TJ, right there. And again, we can go into more details, but that would really scare me because I'd be like, you know, if you want me to spoon feed you prospects all the time and you're not going to go out and hunt for prospects, I think that's a problem. Now, if you got a marketing team built around you and they're generating incoming leads, right, these marketing and qualified leads, that's another story. But if you're a small company and you got to go out there and get the business, that is not the person you want. So I would fire that person immediately. Remember, hire slow, fire fast. What's up, fam? Melvin, what's happening, man? Glad you're here, man. Uh... Yep, my man Buckley. I think uh, we all need to be more. Let me see what you got here, Pete. Uh, let me see. I think we all need to be more intentional and do more homework so we can connect deeper. I think so, man. I think so. I. It's just. It's you know. I'm I'm feeling Craig's pain still because I know what it is to try to sell software. There's so many people that have to be involved into making that decision. Everybody from operations, you know, IT, you know, uh, if you look at the manufacturing, if it's, if it's an ERP system, uh, if it's integrated within a CRM system, you know, blah, all these, right? Then you got to get the lawyers involved because of privacy issues. All this stuff is going on. And it's how do you wrangle all this? I mean, when you got about, when you got a spec that could be 100 to 200 pages, it's a very difficult sell, man, very difficult sell. Ahmed, Noor, as a leader, what can you do? What can you I do to motivate my team because of delays of product and customer canceling their orders, which is their commissions they work so hard for? This is the new normal. You know, this is exactly, Ahmed, I don't know if I have an answer, so I'll be right up front with that. But that is an issue that a lot of companies are having because of the, the pandemic, uh, because of, for example, here in the U.S., our issues with China and trade, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of delays, you know, in the supply chain. And, you know, salespeople are irritated, if not mad, because, you know, they work so hard, as you point out, to close the deal, Ahmed, that all of a sudden, you know, they can't deliver, right? You know, I, I remember when I was in sales, that used to happen, you know, the product delivery wasn't there, but it was totally different reasons. This right here is a little scarier because we simply don't know when the supply chain is going to come back into place. And so the answer is, I don't know, man. I, it's a hard one because, you know, the, the only suggestion that, that I've seen work is that, you, you try to stay in contact with your customers that you've sold, and you try to keep them up to date. The worst thing you can do is go silent on a customer and not keep them posted on what's going on. And if there's a delay, be honest. The, the one thing you can control, remember it's always about things you can't control and things you can control. The one thing you can control is your level of integrity. And that being, you know what, we're gonna be honest with our customers. If we're gonna have delays and it's out another two weeks, you know. Let's see if we can do that. If there is a way, uh, I got friends in the pool business, right? And the pool business is the same thing. It's now the six to eight month delay. Now that winter's coming in, that's even pushed out. And so they're wrestling with how do we create loyalty programs so that people don't cancel their pool order for next year? How do we pull them in? And so they're fighting with different strategies to actually do that. Because again, salespeople are frustrated, right? They close deals, but all of a sudden they couldn't get the pools built in time. And now they push it out to next year. And you know, if you push it out, you know, it might go away. So I think communicating with your customers is probably the easiest answer I can give you. It's a hard one, man. It's a hard one because we don't know. And the customer's asking when, when, and you're like, I don't know. I don't know. And the poor salespeople, they're put in that position where they got management on one side saying, don't lose the customer and the customer say, well, when will I get it? I don't know. When will he get it? I don't know. And it's a very hard position to be in. So that's a hard one, man. Sorry about that. I couldn't help you more, but I psychologically support you. How's that? Victor, what's up, Vic? So good to be, uh, Greg, good luck with that, man. It's a tough one, brother. It's a tough one, man. In B2B, I find issuing a complete agenda, including additional notes, etc. I also ask for feedback prior to the Zoom call. Uh, stimulates much better com conversation. I think this is what I was alluding to with Craig is that, you know, sometimes it's better just to kind of maybe do some pre-calls before the actual meeting. And so, it first of all, it gives you a sense of familiarity with the actual person before you actually connect with them. And then sometimes it's easier to ask questions before you get into the meeting 
as opposed to asking these questions. So for example, if I got five people in the meeting, getting back to Craig's issue, if I got five people in the meeting, and let's say I got, I'm just exaggerating for effect here, I got the CSO, the CMO, the CO, the CIO, and the CTO, right? And then I spent about 20 minutes talking to the CMO about what this thing can do as far as a marketing platform, what it can do for their product. The other four or five people may tune out with the exception of the CEO. And so I think if you have all this information prior to actually being in the meeting, I think you can hit everybody very quickly. And one of the things I've seen that works is finding a way to invite to get everybody involved in a conversation. That's why if you can keep the meeting small, three to five, three is ideal, five, you're pushing it. But if you can keep it to three, I think it's, it's functional. Remember in the book, um, uh, Virtual Selling by the Rain Group, that the more people you add, the Ringelman effect, the more people you add, the less engagement there is. And so I, th I believe the number off the top of my head was three. Three was the magic number. Beyond three, it's hard to get people engaged. So Craig, keep that in mind. That uh, Again, read the book Virtual Selling by the Rain Group. There's some great tips in there. If you're doing enterprise sales virtually, that book by the Rain Group is the book to get. There's so many insightful things in there with regard to holding people in a conversation, but for enterprise sales, that is the ideal book. And if you're doing end-to-end -end sales, if you want a broad stroke as far as sales virtually, then I would get Jeb Blunt's book, Virtual Selling, as well. Two great books, two different approaches, two different viewpoints, So, but both worth the time. Uh, let me see, I'm, I'm skipping some of these names. How would you go about selling life insurance and investment uh, LinkedIn via B2C? Investments on LinkedIn uh, via B2C. <clears throat> well, I'm going to tell you how you wouldn't do it, which is what happens to me all the time, is that I continue to get people who connect with me and then immediately try to sell me something, right? Victor, can we get on the call with you for five minutes, right? Hey, I want to see how I can help you. Is there any way we can get on the call? I'm like, I don't even know you. I just connected with you. So that's the way not to do it. The thing is, everybody wants to rush into a sale. This is the problem. Everybody wants to rush into the sale and just close the deal. When I'm on LinkedIn, everybody wants to friend me. And as soon as they friend me, boom, guess what they do? It's like an offer. It's like, you know, I just met you, want to have sex. You know, that type of thing. Instead of saying, why don't we focus in on, why don't we take a step back, Melvin? And you probably know this already. Why don't I figure out who I want to sell to? Like what type of insurance? It's life insurance. But who's my ideal client? If it's life insurance slash investment, who's more likely to buy? Let's say for you, it would be people who are like at a VP level and above. Beautiful. Now, I would look at my database. If you have a CRM, look at my database and see who in the past has bought my products or services in this case, right? And then figure out who do I need to target? And then ask myself, what's my LinkedIn strategy? In other words, am I putting com comments on there? Am I actually sharing articles that are not about me, but about what's happening and the possibilities? Am I connecting with, let's say, if I had 25 people in my radar, on my radar, and then for the next month, two months, I just continue to comment on what they write, engage with them online little by little, and again, like, share, that whole thing, drop little comments, you know, respond, so forth, and, so, and begin a relationship. And then somewhere, and you'll feel it, maybe it's after a month or two, you'll feel, okay, now's the time to ask for the first date. That's how I would do it. There is no, you know, everybody's trying to get into, everybody thinks LinkedIn's Navigator, the, the golden Rolodex, everybody's just trying to get a quick sale. Step back, breathe, and figure out who you want to sell to, and then begin the engagement process. This is where the sales engagement platforms really come into play because they allow you to kind of work out your engagements, your cadences. But again, I still say it's about intention and sincerity. If you really want to help people, then again, first connect with them at a personal level, an emotional level, before you try to get them to close the deal. I know that's not the big answer you wanted, but there it is, brother. So... Uh, let me see. You talked about chunking. Half a day for learning two to three lines in complex B2B. Will this work? No, I think if I was doing a B2B, Kamlesh, it really depends on what you're learning. These guys were learning to leave the perfect voicemail. That's what they were practicing, right? Intonation, the whole bit. <clears throat> what you and I probably would consider very something very easy, some people may have a hard time with it, right? So if I'm doing B2B, what do I need to practice? That's really the lesson. What do I need to practice? So, for example, let's you and I talk B2B. Let's say that one of the things 
that I need people to learn. One of the things I need people to learn is they got to execute on the demo, right? Let's say I'm doing a demo, right? And I'm doing this online. It's a, I don't know, it's an enterprise piece of software. It's a million dollar piece of software. And I got to do this online. Let me just push it down, collect camera so I can write something out. So then what I would do is within the demo, I would then say, okay, let's practice how you would run a demo. And let's say, these are five, one, two, three, four, five, six things, Cam Lesh, six, six things that you know that you want the customer to understand that your software can offer. Let's just start there, right? So this one may be how to, I don't know, integrate whatever it may be. I would take that as my first chunk and I would practice that. Show me how you deliver that piece right there. Show me how you walk through that piece of the demo right there. No, 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 don't do the whole thing. I just wanna see how you show that feature. I want to see what menus you drop down on and how many clicks does it take you to get to show something visual. And tell me what you say to tee it up and then show them. And then what do you say to close it? So for example, what do I say? What do I show? And then what do I ask? Say, show, ask. Let's chunk that and let's make sure you got that down. That would be my first chunk right there. See what I mean? So you can chunk anything, any way you want. So if they want to practice lines, that's great, but maybe you want to chunk this. Look at your prospecting, your outreach program, same thing, you can chunk it. All, all my man was trying to say is that by reducing the scope of what you're trying to learn and then focusing on that, you become very good at that. Now imagine we spend a whole day, half day, let's just say half day, and we learn all six of these modules. Hopefully, I would spend half a day getting everything down, and then I would spend the second half of the day, having them run through the whole thing, right? And really making sure that everybody understands how to give a great demo. Let me know what you think of that, Kim Les. Let me know if you agree or disagree. But again, you could use it anyway. Tim Alt, my man, says, excellent info. Tim, thank you very much, man. Sparrow's Tale, what do you got? How to make the most out of lulls, low sales week. We all have them, right? The, I think it's all the you got to make sure that you're putting in the reps. You know, it's like when you go to the gym, you got to put in the reps and sometimes you don't see anything developing. So I would ask myself, am I doing the reps? Because remember, the prospect call you make today is for a deal you're going to close two months from now. So really, if you have a lull today, maybe it's because two months ago you didn't make the calls. So that's my mindset, right? So always keep that in mind that the lull you have today is because you didn't sow back here to get the lull here. That's why you have the lull here rather. So keep that in mind. So, so let's do the things we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis so that two months from now, we're not having any more lulls. That's the best way of looking at it. Uh, Think and Grow Rich, man. It's a great book, man. It's a classic. Who doesn't love that book? But that's not the book I was thinking about. Ah, oh, is it Man and the Symbols? It's a guy, Victor, Victor something, Victor. Come on, guys, help me out here. You know what I'm talking about. Remember, he's in prison. He wrote this book in his head. And then when he got out, he actually wrote the book. Victor Frankel. I think that's the book. Victor Frankel might be the author. So anyway, let me know what you guys think. Uh, Pete, thank you, man. I like the Sales Velocity Academy. Check it out. Like I said, great courses up there. Uh, what else? Uh, how to get yes response when clients are not interested anymore. Saiteha Vojala. Man, that's a name, brother. That's a name. Uh, how to get a yes response when clients are not interested anymore. I would ask you, why aren't they interested? And the other question I would ask is, is that the right client? In other words, am I talking to the right client? Let me, you got to check that one first. Is this the ideal client that would buy my product? Yes then why aren't they interested anymore? That's the question. Why aren't they interested anymore? Did, some, did the time pass? Did they buy from somebody else? What happened? And one of the things we talked about in the past, and I'll just share this, because I got this from um, Tim Reister, actually highlighted this for me, and I, I still love this. And it says, on average, when you, when you look at a cross-section of selling, right, different industries, on average, you'll win... 40% of your business, okay? So by the way, I'm answering your question, Say, Teha, I'm answering your question, man. 40% and you'll lose 60% of your deals. So it's, it's on average, right? You win 40, you lose 60. 
And what they found out is these 60s that the 60 percent that you lost, 20 percent went to your competition. 20 percent went to your competition. Where did the other 40 go? The other 40 percent went to no decision right there. No decision. Why? They went to no decision. Why? Because maybe there was something in your presentation that didn't convince them. So when somebody tells me they're not interested anymore, the question I'm going to ask is, first of all, I'm going to stop selling and says, can I ask you just a personal question to help me out? He says, why did you stop being interested in this product or service? You know, why did you decide not to longer buy it? Whatever question you want to ask. And what you're hoping is that they'll give you information because they may say something like, say, look, Victor, I, I like your product. I said, but you know what? You know, it's been two weeks since we talked and I just bought another product. That tells me they bought from the competition. Or, Victor, you know, I talked to my management. We reviewed your product. And, you know, there's, there's just a couple of things we're not sure of that we, you know, that the, the software has. Can I ask you what they are? And they're going to give me information. And what am I going to do with the information? Am I going to try to sell them? No, because they've already said, no, I'm not interested. What I'm going to do is take that and make sure that when I do the next presentation, I make sure that I hit the right points, that I reduce the objections. One of the, uh, the best courses I have at the Sales Velocity Academy, the best course in the Sales Velocity Academy, is the blocking objections. If you learn how to block objections, you will be more efficient in selling. So again, I would ask the question, why aren't they interested? There's got to be a reason why they're not interested. I would try to figure that out. Is it the right client? If it is, then what happens? Something usually happens. Uh, Mike Gwynn, Glynn, sorry about that. How do you think COVID-19 will permanently change the way we sell? Okay, everybody has their opinions, right? And we know how that, you know, that line about it. Everybody has an opinion and that whole thing. And so, Mike, I think, you know, the example I've used in the past, Mike, is that I said, we were on this trajectory, it's called call it a 45 degree trajectory towards this digital transformation era, right? Uh, we were moving in that direction anyway. I think the COVID is just made a 90 degree right turn. We're there, right? I still, you know, call me the, that optimist, call me that guy in the room that's always an optimist, because I think this is good. This is good because some of the changes we're seeing, and again, it depends on the industry, but I'm telling you, I see a lot of good things. Now, I lost 90% of my business, Mike, just to give you an idea. Come March 20th, lockdown, I lost 90% of my business because I do a lot of keynotes and trainings publicly. So I like 90% of my business. And I'm still feeling pretty damn good about where we're going, right? I'm not good about the virus. I'm good about what's changed. What's happening is that virtual is now becoming a new accessible medium. By accessible, I mean people who weren't used to or who were technophobes, Luddites, are now using technology. One. So the average, for example, baby boomer, let's take those guys who are kind of like the Luddites, right? Don't like technology. Now, even baby boomers know how to use Zoom, right? They know how to jump on, on a Zoom call or a conference call. So now technology is more accessible, now more acceptable. Also, keep in mind, and from a sales standpoint, we used to have to get on a plane, and we used to have to go visit a customer and then come back. The cost of sales to get on a plane day one, go meet with the customer day two, fly back day three, three days out of the office, not including opportunity costs of what I could have been doing while I was in the office. And then what we're seeing now is the cost of sales starting to drop. But yet companies are finding that they're selling just as effectively with less salespeople and costs are dropping. Profit margins are increasing. So a lot of companies are saying, you know what, let's scale this way. Let's figure out how to way to move towards this digital transformation. I don't know if you saw the announcement by um, uh, Microsoft. Microsoft is now basically telling their people we're going to have hybrid workplaces, which means, you know, if you want to work from home, you could do that. From here to July 31st of 2021, they're saying it's okay. Google's doing the same thing. You want to stay home and work from home? So now the, the stigma of selling from home is not bad. And the example I mentioned earlier about the, uh, my coaching client who sells insurance, he's finding out that he's closing less deals, right? His closing rate is less, but the amount of business he's booking because of the meetings he's setting up virtually is increasing, which means he's way, all way positive on his profit. So he's doing exceptionally well. So there's that balance there. So what will be the permanent change? I think the permanent change will be this, is that we as salespeople will now deem remote selling virtual selling, distance selling, call it what you will, as something that's acceptable and is now part of the toolkit. 
Customers won't feel strange. Now think about this. I mean, Mike, think about this. If you go back, uh, you know, let's say January, February, and you said, hey, let's get on a Zoom call. Let's work out some issues with the, this enterprise software. Blah. People are like, what? What do you mean get on a Zoom call? Today is like almost a hat trick, like really easy to do. Let's get on. Let's get a bunch of people on. And let's have this conversation. So technology has now become more palatable. I also like the fact that the stigma of working from home has now gone away. The scarlet letter is no longer there. You know, if you used to stay at home and work, people go, ah, you're not really working. Now people are working from home. We also have to ask ourselves, are people, salespeople I'm talking about, happier? And I got a feeling salespeople, I don't know. This is my finger to the wind analysis here, Mike, but I think salespeople are somewhat happier in the, in the, in the in, you know, all included, right? There's some people who don't like it, but I think the majority are saying, I kind of like this because now I can work from home, work my own hours. Cause you know, us as salespeople, we like to work our own hours. We don't like to be managed too much. So I think it fits. I just think it's another tool. When we go back to normal, right? I think a lot of salespeople are going to question whether they should get on a flight. Maybe they'll use video or you know virtual calls to qualify even harder before getting on a flight. But I'll leave you with this last data point, not to bore you too much on this one, but this was interesting. In, in the Rain Group's book, Virtual Selling, which I already mentioned, there was a, there was a number in there that said 82% of buyers, right? 82% of buyers will reach out to your, will look at a buyer's, a seller's LinkedIn profile before contacting them. So buyers are going on their own journey to explore information, to decide who they kind of want to look at, right? And then they're going to your actual LinkedIn account to see if they want to buy from you. So I, I think what we're seeing is that now people are finding their way on the internet to your product or service, which is why marketing is important. But the fact that they're not going to reach out to you and your profile can pull them in, I think there's going to be a, a serious connection there. So I think, look, I think LinkedIn, I mean, here's my prognostication, Mike. LinkedIn will either buy somebody or will be bought out by somebody. I'm talking a large company. What you're about to see is a consolidation of technology companies. You're going to see the, the, the Salesforce. People are trying to compete with the Salesforce.com. What you might see is Microsoft already bought LinkedIn. We know that. But what you're going to start seeing, I think, is Microsoft buying all these different companies to build this big enterprise behemoth to actually deal with the end-to-end -end customer journey. And so I think in the future, B2B will be pushed more into digital channels. That's my, that's my short answer or long answer to your short question. Sorry about that, man. Uh, Tim says right to the point. Victor, 1099 or W2? 1099, brother. You know what I mean? It depends how much freedom you want. You know what I mean? So uh, I'm, I'm a 1099 guy. So, you know, by the way, for my international people, in case you're wondering what he's asking. So 1099 is that means you work for yourself as an independent business person, right? A W-2 is when you work for a company. And so I like 1099 because that's freedom. And a lot of companies are now hiring 1099s, right? Because of tax benefits and, you know, reduced overhead. So I would go with 1099, man. I would go that. Thanks for the answer. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Manage expectations up front. All the time, Matt. All the time. Cup of tea's in here. Hey, right back at you, cup of tea. Glad you're here. Ariana Tandazo. I like that name, man. I like that name. Where are you from, Tan Ariana? And let me see. Which book would you recommend for closing a deal? Oh, these are always hard. Blessings 007. The, there's so many good sales books out there. There's so many great videos out there on closing. But I always get back to this. And you guys chime in. You tell me if I'm wrong. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to just say this, man. You guys, can, you guys can fire back. He said, I'm sick of these books on closing. I'm sick of these books on closing. I'm sick of them. 101 ways to close, blah, blah, blah. 250 ways to say blah, blah, blah. Look, at the end of the day, if you have a great presentation, it's really a matter of asking for the order. And you just figure out, have to figure out a way to ask for the order. You don't need a lot of closes. You just need one good close. I, I always refer to this, that it was Bruce Lee who said, I'm not afraid of a man that, you know, has 10,000 kicks and practices them one time. I'm afraid of the man that practices one kick 10,000 times because that is a master. I think salespeople should learn how to master one, maybe two closes. But again, 
if you do the presentation the right way, if you block the objection, reduce the re, you know, resistance, you, you be, build that value, you have the great rapport, you have the conversation, you have the connection, you understand the pain, and at the end, it's a matter of, is there any reason we shouldn't get started? That's my line. That's the only close I really use. Is there any reason we shouldn't get started? That's it. And so I don't have to master a lot of clothes. A lot of books out there, um, just a lot of books out there. I don't want to recommend one because then if I recommend one, somebody else gets mad at me. And at the end of the day, you know, you just have to memorize one or two that you're comfortable with. So make sure you're comfortable with it. Douglas Hay, how do you overcome the objection of a prospect needing to think about it and really pushing to do so? So Douglas, here, I'm going to give you the short answer on this one because i got to get off this line, uh, call here. So uh, go online and type in Victor Antonio. That's my name for the person who was asking, Victor Antonio. And then type in, let me think about it. And you'll see my video on how to handle the I'll think about it. I came up with that phrasing. It is genius. It works if you apply it the right way. Don't, don't abuse it. Just use it. Uh, predictablepremium.com. Okay, I don't know what that is, but great self-promotion. Ahmed, knowing this crisis going on globally, what advice can you give me for the fourth quarter? By the way, we sell home furnishings and sales are up. I love it. So I bet you your online sales have to be really up, right? Uh, so what advice would you give fourth quarter? By the way, we sell home furnishings and sales are up. The you know, your biggest challenge is going to be supply chain, right? Getting the actual supplies. But I think right now, people are buying online. I mean, people are buying bigger things online, furniture included. And so if I was running that business, I'm in sales, I'm working with marketing to see what type of leads are coming in and see what marketing is doing. So I would really push the marketing angle quite a bit. That would be me. And I don't know if you sell retail or commercial. So uh, Kamala says, I agree. And I think we talked about the different process. All right, you guys are... Uh, here he is. Man Search for Meaning. Raga Senga. Thank you very much, man. You saved me on that. Man Search. Victor Frankl, Man Search for Meaning. That's the book I was looking for. Anyway, I got to get off here. I only wanted to do this half an hour where it's almost an hour into this thing. Uh, Ahmed Noor says, thank you, Victor. You're my hero. That's a little bit much, but man, I don't know. Uh, Jordan Belfort, brother. I like him, man. I, I, I want to interview him on my Sales Influence podcast, man. So I'm with you. Uh, there's one I missed here by the Humble Rioter. <laughs> All right, man. This is the last one I'm taking because it's just a great name. Mm -hmm. If a small business tries to capture their lives engine oil market, their lives engine and increase their sales, what they must do, there are six major players in the industry, tries to capture their, I don't understand that, their lives engine oil market. Uh, so I don't know. You're going to have to add some flavor on that one, man. In fact, uh, hit me up on the comments, and then I'll try to look at the comments and answer it in the comments. But in the meantime, uh, I do want to just highlight this, man. My final thoughts before I sign off. So my final thoughts are this. Uh, learn, practice, do. We got that down. I think we hit a lot of topics on virtual selling and remote selling. I think there's an upside to what can be done, and, and there's a lot of things to be done. Uh, is this going to be with us for a while? I think the digital transformation has just been accelerated and digital selling is just going to become a fact of life. I think it's going to get more creative. Uh, what's coming down the pipe is you really have to look at what's happening in the artificial intelligence you know, uh, playground on how these companies are combining, joining to create these platforms that are going to be just monster sales machines, right? That can actually sell effectively. And so that, I think, is the future. But in the next five years, what you're going to see is that the buyers, B2B especially, most people don't think it's going to happen with B2B, but B2B buyers are going to be going more online, continue with their customer journey, and in many cases begin to eliminate you, the actual salesperson, from the actual sales process, which is why I don't think salespeople will be, you know, I, that gotten rid of. They'll just be displaced. Your role will change. Maybe it'll be more of a consultant role. Maybe it'll be more of a customer service, a super customer service type person. It may be several things, but it will transform into something else. But the reality is here, remote selling is not going away. And for everyone, for those salespeople are going, I can't wait to get back to face-to-face -to -face and go golfing and taking people out to dinner. I'm not saying those times are gone. I think it's it, it's going to be less than what it used to be. And companies are now going to question whether that's a good strategic move from a cost of sales standpoint. And on that note, this is Victor Antonio again, just signing off here. My Matt Buckley's still up there. And again, check out the Sales Velocity Academy when you get a chance. And remember, 
Selenate hard when you know how, when you get a moment, share this with at least one person. That would make me happy. And we'll see you next time. Take care.